Operation Upway was the Metropolitan Police investigation into three similar hammer attacks in the borough of Richmond upon Thames in the city of London. Twickenham Green and Hampton were considered safe, but the attacks changed public perception from early 2003 until 2004. The attacks were brutal and targeted, with young women being the focus of the offender. Each victim had either been standing at a bus stop or had been walking home late at night. Each had been listening to music, unaware that the offender was walking up behind them with a mallet or hammer. Three attacks would be listed under the operation, however, more would eventually be tied in because of their similarity and proximity to other attacks. The first attack was documented in early 2003. Jessie Wilson was a 16-year-old girl who had been struck with a hammer in January 2003. She had suffered massive head injuries but the case had initially been labelled accidental. Everyone thought that Jessie had accidentally slipped on ice close to her house and smashed her head and face. Everyone accepted the accident as being the only answer because nothing else made much sense. However, the similar coincidence of an almost identical case one month later would have Jessie's family, doctors, and the police, taking a closer look into her injuries. Marsha McDonnell was found murdered in Hampton. She had lived with her family in Hampton and had been returning home from the cinema, having watched Catch Me If You Can. A neighbor heard a thud and door slam but when he peeked outside, he couldn't see anything. The next thing that he knew, he was awoken to sounds of a woman moaning outside. The man and his wife discovered Marsha on the ground, bloody and badly injured. Marsha died a short time later. Over a year later, another woman would be found brutally murdered. Amélie de Lagrange was a French student living in London. Amélie worked in a French coffee shop and loved the British way of living. In a cruel twist, Amélie had told those closest to her that she felt safe in London. Honestly, this isn't surprising. Amélie was living in Twickenham, which is considered a very safe place. She too had been attacked with a heavy, blunt weapon. Amélie had catastrophic head wounds and had fallen face first onto concrete paving slabs. This resulted in further injuries and Amélie died at the hospital because of her head injuries. Amélie's phone and some of her other belongings were missing and police suspected that the killer must have taken them as some type of trophy. Cell phone investigations would provide a lead. Amélie's phone had last pinged in Walton-on-Thames, six miles from the scene. A local 16-year-old from Hampton was the initial prime suspect because he had followed a teen at night. This was not long before Marsha had been found murdered and upon hearing news of a grisly murder. The Hampton community was desperate for answers. The boy was withdrawn and had been described as creepy. Police felt as though he could be connected. Additionally, psychological profiling played a role in police suspecting that this teen was their killer. The teen was currently detained under the Mental Health Act in a facility in Durham. He had been detained since March of 2003. However, police didn't have anything on him other than circumstantial evidence. It would turn out that police and psychological profilers weren't correct in their assumption as to who the killer was. With two attacks occurring whilst the suspected offender was in a facility hundreds of miles away, law enforcement was left confused. They began to question if there were two killers or if the cases were even linked. An attack occurred on 14 April 2004, involving an accountant in her 30s. This woman had left a restaurant by the Green at Twickenham. She was walking home at night when everything suddenly went dark. A person driving by would notice her laying on the ground and called for assistance. Upon closer inspection, similar head wounds were apparent. It was concluded that her head and facial injuries matched the previous three victims. This woman had to undergo reconstructive surgery but fortunately survived. CCTV from the restaurant and local buses didn't give police their answer and like all of the other cases, the investigation hit a wall. Investigators knew that Amelie's phone had pinged in Walton on Thames. Furthermore, they knew that it had likely been dumped into a body of water. A search in a narrowed down area of the River Thames would lead to the identification of some of Amelie's possessions. Police knew that the killer likely took the possessions. The distance and time that it took to reach Walton on Thames suggested that the killer drove, rather than using a bike or walking. Based on the locations of the crimes, it was surmised that he felt comfortable and was familiar with South West London. A case that wasn't initially considered linked to the hammer attacks was that of 18-year-old Kate Sheedy in Twickenham. Kate's attack had all the hallmarks of the same offender but because a hammer had not been used, it wasn't connected. Kate had just gotten off of a bus and had been walking home when someone ran her over in a Ford Previa. She was left to die but managed to crawl to her phone and called for help. Kate miraculously survived. A break in the case came from CCTV footage from buses travelling around Twickenham. A Ford Courier van stood out because it kept cropping up. It appeared to be cruising around the area, as if the person driving was searching for potential victims. Moreover, the same van was spotted in Walton-on-Thames, with the timestamps of Amelie's phone matching up with its location. 
24,700 of these same make and model vans were scattered about the UK. It was going to be a challenging task, months following the break in the case and still nothing new had been revealed. However, all of that was about to change. A woman by the name of Joanna Collins would arrive at a set-up information center at Twickenham Green. Joanna told police about her ex-partner named Levi Belfield. Levi was a local man, hailing from a traveling family. According to Joe, his mother coddled him and she was still sleeping in the same bed, up until Levi was 16. It was a bizarre mother-son relationship to put it bluntly. Belfield would become a criminal from a young age, breaking into homes. Tragically, his childhood girlfriend named Patsy Morris, had been found strangled. Levi was 12 at the time and many have speculated that Patsy could have been his first victim. It has been said that Levi was probably rejected by blonde girls or they had made fun of him at school. Either way, rejection and mockery is a part of life that people need to overcome themselves. However, Levi couldn't handle it. He hadn't always been big and so he began taking steroids and training to probably compensate for feeling inferior. Eventually, he began working as a bouncer and wheel clamper. By the time that Joe attended the police information center, Levi currently owned a white van and had a steady supply of disposable vehicles that could be crushed at any time. Joe informed police that their relationship was one of constant abuse. She would admit to police that Levi hated women and seven years earlier, she had discovered a knife and balaclava in his jacket pocket. He'd even slashed a cosmopolitan magazine, cutting out blonde women's faces. Additionally, he knew Twickenham and Walton on Thames as he used to drink at pubs in both areas. All of this inside information was both shocking and startling. Levi Belfield quickly became a prime suspect. Also, it would turn out that the same make and model van had been sold to a wheel clamping gypsy by the name of Levi. To add confirmation to Levi Belfield being the owner, police did some extra digging to confirm his mobile phone number. When this was confirmed it was revealed that Belfield had used the same number that he'd used to report his neighbor to a terrorist hotline. Belfield was put under surveillance and police witnessed the predator in action. They saw the type of person who they were dealing with. Belfield was a sexual predator and pulled over at a bus stop to chat to a pair of schoolgirls. Belfield asked them their ages before asking if they were virgins. The girls uncomfortably walked away and Belfield called them slags. As mentioned, Belfield had been a bouncer and because of this, he was familiar with the nightclub scene. The club scene is rife with drugs and Levi had received 250 ecstasy tabs. He wanted to sell them at a profit. Therefore, he enlisted a man to help him out with storing them in a safe place. Belfield being a bully, knew how to force and manipulate people to his advantage. The man was scared of him and did as he was told, hiding the tabs in his sick mother's flat. She was hospitalized at the time. About a month later, Belfield's secret 16-year-old partner had a 14-year-old friend over and Belfield decided to take advantage of this other young girl. He called the man who had stashed the tabs and told him to take the girl to his mother's flat. Afterwards, he was to give the girl some tabs and wait for Belfield. He was complicit under fear and did this. The 14-year-old girl would later awake to find that she'd been assaulted. This was likely a gang rape, something that Belfield and his closest friends had been known to participate in. Upon learning about what had occurred in the flat, the man would pluck up the courage to challenge Belfield about everything. The man and Belfield got into a verbal argument. As things cooled off, the man turned to walk away and Belfield ambushed him with a hammer. Belfield pretended to care and put on a false persona to police. He had been an informant and knew how to maneuver his way out of a jam. Belfield was never charged with this crime but it is obvious that he was the culprit. Additionally, many sexual assaults involving young female clubbers and the date rape drug GHB involved Belfield. He was a prolific rapist and his jobs put him in powerful positions to abuse young women. Investigators were now confident that Levi Belfield was their killer. An arrest warrant was signed and police barged into Belfield's home in West Drayton. Belfield lived here with his partner, the mother of three of his children. At first nobody could find him but hours later Belfield would be found hiding in the loft. He claimed that he owed money and was hiding from his dealer. Belfield was arrested and taken to Heathrow Police Station. He had been captured and suffered from depression throughout his life, which may explain his next decision. Having been assigned a prison cell, Belfield actually tried and failed to kill himself. He did this by tightening a tape around his neck which was then used to asphyxiate himself in the toilet bowl. When this didn't work as expected, Levi yelled out for help and was saved from his predicament by a guard. Levi was interrogated about the crimes but didn't confess to anything. No DNA evidence tying him to the crimes was found in his home but CCTV evidence personal accounts from friends of Belfield's and his partner making a phone call to him prior to Amelie's murder, proved that Belfield had been driving the van that evening. 
all of these pieces of evidence would help play a role in getting him convicted of the two murders and countless other attempted murders. Belfield was an imposing and intimidating figure to those around him. He was known for being violent and evil. Levi abused his partners physically and sexually and even allowed his friends to sleep with them if they misbehaved or committed minor infractions. He was a typical example of a bully, someone who used and abused people for self-gain and pleasure. It would later come out that some people had actually been in his car when he got out to attack women at bus stops. Levi Belfield was remanded in custody and charged with the murders of Marsha McDonnell and Amelie de la Grange. He was also hit with the attempted murder of Kate Sheedy. To prove that Levi ran Kate over, police used blurry cell phone footage from hours after the attack. Levi was seen holding a torch, presumably to check for damage to his car. This footage had been recorded by the 16-year-old whom he was sleeping with. Belfield's trial would be long and painful for surviving victims and deceased victim family members. Ultimately, he would be found guilty of the murders of Marsha and Amelie, along with the attempted murder of Kate. The serious nature of the crimes led to him being given a whole life order, which is reserved for the most dangerous criminals. Belfield was sent to a Category A prison called HMP Franklin. Levi Belfield would be charged with the abduction and murder of schoolgirl Millie Dowler. Belfield denied the claim but there was much evidence tying him to the crime. Belfield's partner, the mother of three of his children, recalled his strange behavior following the disappearance of Millie. Some of the things that struck her as odd included. Belfield switching off his phone, which was uncharacteristic of him. Him returning home late, having been drinking, and being unable to sleep that night. Him blaming his ruined bedding on his dog, who was house-trained. His partner's car suddenly disappearing days later. Levi Belfield was convicted of Millie Dowler's murder in summer 2011. Levi Belfield was now behind bars forever, but even behind the wall, he terrorized former partners and victim family members. He reportedly put a hit out on his ex-partner Joanna and wanted acid thrown at her. Belfield also converted to the Muslim faith whilst behind bars, now going by the name of Yusuf Rahim. He probably converted to Islam because it is the largest group in the British prison system. He befriended and has been known to associate with other notorious killers, like Mark Dixie and Wayne Cussons. All these men are imprisoned for serious sex crimes. Whilst behind bars, Belfield has been questioned about unsolved crimes across Britain. His hammer attack modus operandi lines up with unsolved cases dating back to the early 1990s. The most notable crime being the murder of a mother and her child, known as the Chillenden murders back in 1996. It is unclear if Belfield is guilty of this crime because another man is locked up for it. However, Belfield was a dangerous man and had links to Kent, Sussex and Bristol. Therefore, his victim count is presumably higher than three. In 2023, it has been reported that Belfield is getting prepared to marry a blonde woman.